All you have to know is that Jesus is a healer. All you have to know is that he's compassionate. Bless God, he comes by and he picks you up out of the dirt, out of the pain of your life, and he lifts you up on solid ground. He said, look, I love you. I care about you. I'm the healer. I'm your blesser. I'm your savior. I am the one you've been looking for. Trinity Gospel Temple presents Brother Dave and the Hour of Power Singers. Bless you, everybody. So good to be with you today. Thank you for tuning us in. It's always a pleasure to be able to share with you. And I consider it an honor that you take the time to tune in Brother Dave and the Hour of Power Singers telecast and are ready for to, to be blessed. So God is a blesser. And today is the day that he's made, and we're going to rejoice in it. So stay tuned. I have a great program planned for you. I know you'll enjoy it. Stay tuned. From this level here today, new foundations being laid. Here we won't be satisfied tearing down religious pride. And God is calling us to go. God is calling us to go. To a place his spirit flows. To a place his spirit flows. Higher than we've been before.
Amen.
Jeez, man. Turn with me, if you will, and just face the back where the cameras are, and we're going to be praying for people around the world. Heavenly Father, it is such a great delight to come to you knowing that you hear us when we pray. And we have an advocate. We know we have Jesus right there at your side, interceding on our behalf. And Lord, how we thank you for your presence today. We pray for those, Lord, who don't already know you as Lord and Savior of their life. Holy Spirit, do your office work. Convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Draw people to the cross where they can find peace in the midst of their storm. Oh, Lord, reach out today to people everywhere that need help, whether it's our bikers or truckers carry the commerce across the road. Or, Lord, if it's our those friends that are in the reservations or wherever people may be, Lord, our friends that support the ministry from the farthest point from this point. We're so grateful for that, Lord Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to reach down upon those who are suffering today. So many people, Lord, who have become somewhat elderly and now are struggling. Sometimes it's immobility and sometimes they've been hit by a stroke or something. And Lord, they just need your help. And I know you, you said I'd never leave you nor forsake you. And Lord, I just ask you to lay your healing hand upon those who need special help today. Raise them up. Speak peace into their heart. Let them know you're on their side and you're never going to leave them. And they're going to make it fine because you're with them. In Jesus' precious name. Lord, people around the world are lifting up your name today. Many on the mission field, some places where it's dangerous to preach Christ. Seventeen nations of the world, Lord, hate Christians and Jews and treat us like we're some, some low person. But Lord, we know that no matter where our people are serving you, no matter how difficult you said you'd be with them, with them and I pray that you are today. Lord, we pray for our missionaries and for our pastors and Sunday school teachers and aides and everyone that helps get the gospel message out. How we pray that you'll continue to do the good work. Bless our government, Lord. Bless our military. Bless those that watch over us locally, Lord, our state highway sheriff, city police, fire department, Lord, and our first responders. Send revival across the world, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Everybody said amen. Praise God. To our God, every word of worship, which is one of four.
some scripture first. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we can read right off the screen together. This is, will be the foundation. This will be the last in this particular series that I've done on the refulgent incubator. I'll begin a new series next Sunday, and you'll appreciate this title, God's Inscrutable and Auspicious Plan. That's next week. Let's read. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from, our, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. I want you to notice that a lot. Uh, people who are oneness, you know, we call them Jesus-only people who have a problem seeing that there's a trinity. They always think that Jesus is the Father you'll see that the Apostle Paul do, does this often in his writings. Now, notice, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's two right there. So, you know that you've got to be Holy Spirit that make it three. All right, let's see. We've got three more verses. Let's go on. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you for that wonderful promise at the end of those scriptures. We just, we have that confidence, and we give you the praise. Now, anoint us not only to preach, but anoint us to receive the truth. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. you. May be seated. Really fabulous to see you today and glad that you saw fit to come here today. It was a great service in the nine o'clock hour, and our guest from uh, Spain was speaking, Peter Romano. He was preaching the word. Great, great message. And I appreciate working with Brother Dana. Him and I are just as close as. Uh, there's not one iota or modicum of distance between him and I. <laughs> Amen. And so we have a lot of fun. And we, and we do have fun, too. We laugh a lot, too. Amen. I'd be disingenuous today if I did not express how unable I am to fathom or adequately express my awe of how privileged we are to serve our God as ambassadors and fellow mandated workers. Don't you feel privileged to serve him? I never get over it. I tell you, I never, never get over it. When I contemplate the ebullience, that, 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 this, that that's joy and that love, loveliness that springs out of him, it's so resplendent, it's beyond words, of his holiness and how he permits us I don't know, maybe you've not thought about how mere and fallible you are. Uh, you know, maybe you're one of these people that have a great deal of confidence in your physique and you work out and maybe you've got some good education and you feel you're sharp in the mind and everything. But, you know, when I come to God, I just feel like a mere fallible individual. I don't know why. I just, because I know that in myself I am frail and fallible. That's what amazes me. And even though that we are 
as we come to him, we, ha we are in such need. Uh, maybe I'm not talking to everybody today, but I think I'm talking to some. Such need. And, and when we just think about how he elevates us. I, I prayed for a number of people in line. We prayed together for a number of people in line who felt they had low spirits, low energy, and just kind of get down easily and so on. And Jesus represents the very opposite of that. He's resplendent. He's full of power and joy, and he love and love. His love is just surpassing anything you could possibly know. But I'm overwhelmed that he picks us to spread the gospel of the good news that people might find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. Look at Mark 16 and 15. We'll just look at the first part. It says, go into all the world and preach. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, why do you think he would want that to happen? Because the gospel is the liberating force. It's hearing the gospel that affects you and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes upon you as you open yourself to the gospel. See, the Holy Spirit's about the business of convicting of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of arousing you to the fact that you need him and you can't do it on your own. You need Christ. You need to have him in your heart. And this great commission proves that God has placed his implicit and un, unabashed trust in us to carry out his plan of redemption. That's what amazes me. And with his mantle upon us, we can use the rest of 2018 for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can see a myriad of souls come to Christ before it's eternally too late for them. And that's what he offers. We can have that extraordinary promise. So God's refulgent incubator, his great brightness and resplendence, and the incubator, a place where people can find Christ. I've often said to people, yes, these are steps, and real nice-looking steps, carpeted real nice, but it is also an altar, and this is a birthing place. Many thousands of people have found Jesus at this altar, people of all shapes, People of all kinds, all ethnicities, all colors, all ages, all, eth all genders, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he offers himself to everyone. No one is outside the circle. Isn't that amazing? So the gifts of the Holy Spirit, let's just talk about them a little bit. God has endowed the church. This is what makes us impregnable. He's endowed the church with a litany of supernatural enablements and abilities. And the purpose for this plethora of gifts is to make possible the mobilization of his plan to evangelize the world. And that's what the Great Commission's about. Whether it's in Matthew, whether it's in Mark, wherever you find this Great Commission. His believers that have come to Christ, have come to him through Christ, are mandated, they're appointed and anointed to go forth and to share him with the world. Imagine when he was here, he only had two feet. He had two hands. Yes, eventually the disciples were ordained with him, then later the 10 and then the 17 and then the 70 and so on. They were anointed and they gave more feet. But imagine now in our world, where at least 750 million people claim to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, have Jesus in their heart and the Holy Spirit in their heart. Can you imagine the anointed feet that are out there trodden on those sidewalks today? Can you imagine the amount of hands? And, and, and later on in the month of May, we're going to have the anointing of hands. We're going to anoint your hands with oil. We're going to believe God because hands are so important. And those hands can be laid on people. They can be, you can shake somebody's hand. You can hug somebody. The hand can do so much for God. And we believe God's going to anoint your hands so that we can spread the good news of the gospel. Now, God promises healing, deliverance, and all kinds of things for us who are already Christians. But we must not be lost only in the benefits of the gospel that we utilize to make it from day to day. But we have to realize that God's main, you know, I call this the greatest business in the world. It's the, 
It's the greatest assurance business. There's insurance business. This is the greatest assurance business. And God cares about that business. And that's why in Malachi he says, bring all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse, the meat in my house. And he says, prove me and see. I mean, he's so anxious or eager at least to get you to see the, the, the benefit of supporting this fantastic work that he's established. And he's called us to carry the work on, not with just his two hands and two feet, but our two feet, our hands, our voice, yeah. our prayers in the name of Jesus. And so it makes it possible to do what would be otherwise impossible. The world's too big. There's just too many people. If the anointing of the Holy Spirit didn't get into people, even like my brother sitting on that front row from Spain, he goes all over. He could be in Spain comfortably preaching his own country. They love him there. But you know, never know when you're going to see him passing by. That's at least the second or third time I've seen you. Praise God and welcome me, Romano. I'm telling you, welcome. So back to the ministries. These ministries represent an expression of Christ in you. Let's look at some scripture, 1 Peter 4.10. Look at this. And each one, aren't you glad it includes you? Don't you ever get tired of being excluded? Poor Brother Dave. He was on Stark School's basketball team. He had a jersey. He even had the big S that stood for Stark. And he was in the eighth grade, and he got a chance to practice with the team. And then the game started, and he sat on the bench. <laughs> Poor Brother Dave. You know, you could waller and things like that. I, you, you say, Brother Dave, you've mentioned that twice. You must, re must really bother you. Well, you know, let a guy use <laughs> his experience once in a while without you. But anyhow, <laughs> it's, it's easy to lose confidence. And you wonder some people have low spirits. Let that be a part of your thinking, anyhow. But it's, it's so great that each one, even Brother Dave, that never got to play a varsity game. But I, I bet you many of those players from way back decades and decades ago lost their big ass. I still have my big ass. I've saved it. I need to wear it one of these Sundays. Let's get back down to business. And each one of you, <clears throat> doesn't matter who you are, has received, that's past tense. Once you've come to Christ, each one of has received a gift, minister it to one another. That's what we owe to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. There's another wonderful scripture that really undergirds what I'm saying here, Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> For in him, read with me, this, it, it's, I love to hear you read the Bible. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, not part, all. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. I think you ought to give him an ovation for that. Why don't you give him a hand of praise? <clears throat> Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and he chooses to make us complete in him and thus share with us all that he is. Didn't he say in one scripture, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you? Let's go to John 14 and 12. You think that was a great scripture. Listen to this scripture. Most assuredly, boy, when you, when you see that in the Bible, of course, you understand the translation that may, a different word may be used in the Message Bible or something else or in the Amplified. But when you see that kind of a word, I mean, you're seeing someone that wants your attention. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, now this is, you got to stretch here, the works that I do, will he do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go into my Father. <clears throat> I don't know if you ever thought about that. The works that I did, 
Are we being presumptuous when we lay hands on someone and say, devil, the Lord rebuke you. I rebuke this sickness. I rebuke this paralytic condition. He says that the what works did he do? I challenge you. I know we love the whole Bible, but I think often we ought to go through the Gospels again because there is where you see who Jesus really was. There's where you see the character of Jesus. You see the compassion of Jesus. You see his power and his willingness to heal even to the uttermost. Some of the most despicable conditions are named. Everything. Leprosy, which is a hideous disease. We think cancer is terrible. And there are diseases we know today are terrible. But leprosy, if you had leprosy of any period of time, for your ears fell off, your nose fell off, your pertinences fell off. I mean, it was most despicable. In fact, you weren't even allowed to stay with the normal people. You had to be sent out by yourself in a, a leprous colony of some type. I think it was two years ago where they said they've, they've seen some new cases of leprosy in the world. It's been gone for a number of years. But he never turned anyone away. Blind, deaf. People that were mentally incapacitated in some condition where they didn't even realize that throwing themselves in the fire would burn them and hurt them. Or throwing themselves in the water and they, they would drown. And yet Jesus had compassion on them. He never turned any away. I like the way it described. And they brought to him all those that were dumb and those that were afflicted. And it says he healed them all. What a Jesus that's where my faith is. It's not in myself. It's not in a denomination or in some movement of any sort. My faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Can you give him a praise? So Christ, through the gifts of the Spirit, allows the church to vicariously or in his place function on his behalf and supernaturally enables us to do it. Let's go to some of those gifts. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and look through some of these verses. And let's just see what God has endowed us with. <clears throat> let's begin with the uh, seventh verse. I, in fact, let me read before, just stay there on the seventh verse. Let me just read part of this. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Must be important. He wants us to get this. You know that you were Gentiles carried away with those dumb idols. So when you say dumb devils, okay, dumb idols, dumb devil. However, you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. Watch yourself when you start cursing and saying God's name in vain. It may be dangerous. Sounds like that to me. And then it goes on and says that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And he goes on and says, now watch. He says, now there are diversities of gifts, but of the self-same Spirit. So everybody doesn't have to look alike, think exactly alike, just be committed to one. And if we're all committed to one, we ought to be doing what is right in his sight. But he makes room for diversities here. And he says there are differences of ministries. So in other words, just because I'm not exactly like you, you're not exactly like me. So who's going to be the arbitrator? Who's going to decide? Uh, never mind. I just have a little fun when I'm preaching. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. He goes on. He says there are diversities of activities. So God doesn't leave anybody out here. He said, but it's the same God who works all in all. Now watch how he begins these gifts. Now remember in the past, and I'm kind of reviewing a little bit, but in the past we talked about the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and so on. And I look at those gifts as oversee gifts. I don't think people who are immature or can possibly operate in that. They may, but I don't see without maturity how they can because they're oversee gifts, perfecting the saints. You can't perfect the saints if you haven't had some 
experience and training and maturity. So I know you know what I mean. Not trying to discriminate in any way, but I think that's the way you look at it. But these gifts are very plainly given to everybody. You may not ever be an apostle or a prophet, but you can, you can have the gifts of the Spirit operate in you. Now, here's the way he describes it. He says, but the manifestation, beginning in verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So right away you can see that this is for humble people, for the profit of all. If you're not humble and you're just arrogant, then you're just looking for the attention and you're looking for all the, all the, all the good that comes out of it. But this says it's for the profit of all. So that means you have to be thinking about someone else. Each one is given this. Now he says, verse 8, for the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Now let's just look at that a little bit, wisdom. This is an interesting word, sophias. And yet, if you take sophist sophistry in English, if you take sophistry, that's the negative side of this word. Sophistry always give a pejorative type of look or a negative look to something. But in this sense, this is talking about wisdom that God gives. And in this sense, it's skill. It's skill to give you the ability to make proper decisions. Let me give you an example. You remember Solomon? He had these two women. I don't know how this happened, but obviously one had had a child, and somehow another woman wanted to claim the child. And so they both came to Solomon and said, look, this is our child. We want the child. And Solomon, now, now here's wisdom. He said, I'll tell you what we'll do to make it fair. We'll cut the child down the middle and half to each one. He knew, because he had wisdom, he had a grip, his, he wrapped his arms or his mind around this situation. He knew that the real mother would never well, let that child be cut in two. The real mother said, no, no, please don't do that. And he knew immediately who that, whose child that was. So that's just a little picture of what wisdom. Wisdom is a skill, the ability to look at a situation and make the right decision. Now, you can't do that perfectly on your own. You can have a great deal of education and experience and maturity in the natural. I'm sure that you'll make better choices maybe than someone else, although you wonder when you check Hollywood and other professional people. It doesn't seem to matter how well-equipped they are. They seem to just keep on stubbing their foot and putting their anyhow. It's, it's very interesting. But the gift, of, here's, what, here's what I want to uh, encourage you to do. Especially, let's take a child. Let's take someone just graduating from high school and maybe has some preparatory courses but is going to go to college. And then you come to a place maybe after two years in college where you have to declare your major. The most foolish thing in the world is for anyone that age or any parent to urge their child to go in this field or that field without praying and say, Father, give us wisdom to make the right decision. Why is that? I've seen many a person take a major and get into a field. They couldn't even make a living when they got out of college. I know many a case where people would get a student loan and have thousands of dollars they own, and yet the, what they chose was not well thought out, and as a result, there wasn't enough money in it to even pay their bills. And a lot of times, people that graduate from college, you can find them waiting on tables in restaurants. I'm not against that because that's a noble way to make a living as well. But the point is, how much grief we, would have, we wouldn't have had to bear if we'd have gone to God and we said, Father, you know the future. You know what's best for you. You know me better than I know myself. And mom and dad and, and child, I wish we had those kind of relationships. I don't know if they still exist in families today where the people can pray together and say, oh, Lord, give us wisdom, make right decisions. If you do that and you make the right decision, God will grant you favor. You'll be in the right place at the right time, making the right amount of money so you can have a livable wage, pay your bills. That's what wisdom is. Skill to be able to grapple with something and make the right decision in Jesus' name. Then there's this knowledge. Now, knowledge, you saw knowledge at work, the word of knowledge, while we were in the healing line, and I addressed certain issues that I felt God laid on my heart. Now, these are, now if, if I knew ahead of time that you had that, that would not be the word of knowledge. 
that just simply be my sympathy with you, knowing somehow I heard from you that you had this situation or that. I promise you, I, that's why I don't do it always, because I have to be sure, I scrutinize my mind, my, I make sure that if I make a statement like I do, it's not because somebody has told me about it. I have to be sure that the Holy Spirit, now, so what, I, what am I saying? The word of knowledge is a fact that already existed, but you didn't know about it until God revealed it to you. In other words, something personal in somebody's life or whatever. So you can appreciate that's what that, and that kind of knowledge. Imagine the advantage you have as a business person. If you have these gifts working in your life, imagine if you could operate your business on the proper principles and built on ethics that please God and make right decisions. Imagine how successful you could be as opposed to taking chances and maybe not make it. I don't know if you're getting this today, but I'm having a good time up here. The other gift is pistos. In the, in the, in the Greek, it's pistos, and it's, it's talking about faith. Now, I know that you have to have faith to get saved by faith, by, through grace, or you're, by faith are you saved through grace, or by grace you are saved through faith, as you know. And that's a, a faith that every Christian should have. But I, I see this as a special gift. I see this as an additional, I see this as a more powerful uh, representation of faith. I see this as the gift of faith that can believe for miracles. You know, it's, it's easy to believe that uh, I'm going to be able to pay my bills next week. It's a lot easier to believe, Father, this abnormal thing that I have in my body that the doctor said is absolutely incurable. Lord, I have, it takes supernatural faith to believe that God can correct something that normally cannot be corrected in the natural. And you have to have the faith that God specializes in doing things that are thought impossible. Are you still here? The next Greek word is imotean, or I-A-M-A-T-O-N, how would you pronounce it? It means healing. And it's interesting about healing, it's gifts of healing. That was all the same, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, gifts, plural, gifts of healing. All oh, people make so much out of this. Dr. Alexis Carroll, a number of years ago, he passed sometime in the early 50s, he passed, but he was a great biologist and also a great surgeon. <clears throat> and he became a Christian and he made research into the Word of God. And he got a hold of this where Jesus was whipped 39 times. You know what he concluded after a great deal of study? That each time he was whipped, it represented some sort of disease. Let me see if I have, I always have something in my Bible here. Now, here's some of the diseases I put together, and I'm not a doctor. Imagine I said that each time he got whipped, it represented a segment of disease. Think of this, sensory nervous system, digestive system, re reproductive, indoctrine, controls body functions, hormones, neurological, skeletal, 206 bones, mus muscular, 320 pairs of muscles, thyroid, prostate, circulatory, respiratory, urinary system. Those are just 20 I put together myself. But he put together, he said, that each stripe that he took represented one one plethora of disease, whatever it happened to be, whatever that disease was. <laughs> Excuse me a little bit. I kind of lost my, my momentum here a little bit. I just got to thinking about that. Hallelujah. Thought about every time he took a whip, there goes my hearing. Praise God's back. I didn't even mention uh, optic and audio. I didn't even mention that. So there may be 39 different diseases, but those, those different gifts, maybe there's a different gift for every Category of disease, I don't know, but sounds good to me. I just got to keep up, Brother David, I'm doing good today. And I got to hurry up, I'm almost done. Dynamian, well, you can see that, you can see the word dynamite and dynamo in that word. That's talking about miracles. See, healing, healing is ongoing. You may start, a lot of time when I pray for a person a second time, I'll say, Father, complete the miracle you began in their life because healing is ongoing. Now, a miracle would be instantaneous. When the man came to Jesus with the withered arm, and he said, stretch forth your hand, your hand, and he did that, that was a miracle. That was an instantaneous miracle. 
Then we could go on. Prophetia is about prophecy. Prophecy is interesting. I know not everybody agrees with Brother Dave, but I do believe this, that in this day and life, because we have the scriptures, remember in the old times, during the Old Testament and the New, we didn't have all the scriptures. So we had parts sometime in the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't written during the days of the apostles. There was just happening as they lived. And so it was more necessary for foretelling. And so that's what a lot of it was foretelling. But in the New Testament, I think foretelling would be more important than foretelling. Because I don't have to foretell your future. The Bible tells you. If you get saved, you're not condemned. If you don't get saved, you're condemned already. That's your future. <laughs> so you know what I mean. Now, you can take it differently if you want to. But now, how would you, how would you use, for instance, how would a, the prophecy work in foretelling? Foretelling. Foretelling means you just foretell what's already been written. The way you would do that is supposing you know a person that's having a very desperate time physically, whatever it happened to be. And supposing as you're reading in your word, supposing Mark 9, 23 comes up, if you can believe, all things are possible to the one who believes. Now, what would be the problem with saying you have that person on your mind taking that truth, going to that person and say, here, I give this to you. If you, hey, John, hey, Jane, if you can believe. All things are possible to the one that believes. That's foretelling. Just so you know the difference. Foretelling would be, hey, tomorrow you're going to do this or that, something in the future. But that's just the way I see prophecy. And then there's discerning of spirits. I'm going to end on that. There's more here, but I can't get it all in today. But discerning of spirits, this is an interesting gift because you can't trust yourself totally. I know you, you want positive and you want me to... But I, I, I be, I've, been, I've been living too long. I know about it. You can't fool me. You ever hear, this, you ever hear the statement, you can't out con a con? Been there, done that. Now, so when God, when you feel that God has revealed something to you, you have to always take this test. Is this me? Is this just my overwhelming desire? It may be good. It don't mean it's bad. You may have an overwhelming desire to help someone, and you just get some good thoughts, and you want to impart them, and so you feel like the Lord wants you to share that with them. You have to make sure it's not you, because anybody can do that, just an opinion. You have to make sure it's not the devil. The devil's the big, biggest imposter ever was. He's an imposter. And he can fake you out if you're not careful. You ever hear fake news? The devil originated. The devil originated, not CNN. Devil originated fake news. And then finally, you have to have a good enough relationship with the Father that you can know if it's God, then bless God, go with it. But that's discerning the spirit. You have to discern your own spirit. You have to discern the devil's spirit because he's a liar. Deserve the right spirit, which is God. Amen. Did you get anything out of it today? Let's stand, please. Let me just bless you on your feet while you stand for a moment. I like to brag, brag on Jesus because he's the best friend I have. I, and I, I wouldn't want to live without him. He's the answer to the world's needs, the light to shine in darkness. He's the help for helplessness. He's the hope for hopelessness, the strength for weakness. He's the power for powerlessness, the victory for defeat, the joy for sorrow, the peace for conflict. He's the rest for the restless. He's the star of the morning, the beauty rose of heaven. He's the quietness for the storm, healing for the sickness. He's the sunshine for the cloud. He's the brightness of God's glory. He's the day star of the morning. He's the finest of the heavenly train. He's the miracle worker from heaven. Wonder of wonders, the banner of the church. He's the great conqueror. He's the God who can take away your sins and make you clean as a lily. He's the companion to every believer. Jesus was, is, and always will be. He's my Savior, my Lord, my companion, and my friend. Will you give him a shout? Praise unto the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Brother Dave would be blessed to hear from you this week. Please call toll-free 877-453-2519 or locally 330-453-2519. Our address is TGT Mail at trinitybrotherdave.org or Brother Dave, P.O. Box 20029, Canton, Ohio 44701. When you're in the Canton area, we invite you to visit Trinity Gospel Temple at 1612 West Tuscarawa Street, just off I-77. Or visit us online at www.trinitybrotherdave.org. I'm glad you've been tuned in today. You know, there's something about hearing the Word of God. I never get tired of it. People ask me, Brother Dave, don't you ever get tired? Isn't it ever old hat to you? I tell you, I, I would put my hand on the Bible and tell you in the name of Jesus, it never gets old to me. I have the same tickling feeling inside my spirit when I go to preach and when I read the Bible, when I get studying the Word of God. I just love it, and I know God is real. And you know what? I am so convinced that preaching the gospel sincerely helps people find religion, if find Christ. I found this around the world. It's strange. I have people that support us from Australia. Wouldn't you think that's you know, the bottom of the globe, so to speak, from us here? But, you know, God's not limited. It doesn't matter who you are. And that's why I need you to stand with me. I need Red Book partners. I call it Red Book because one day, and you know, I have no gimmicks. I don't send out anything and promise anything to you. But I did need financial support, and there was a red book on my desk, and it, it was a, like one you'd get in school. I say red. It had a red cover. It had a little springy thing where you could open it, and, and it was just lined eight and a half by 11, and just laying on my desk. Somebody didn't, gave me a couple of copies like that, I don't know, thinking I could use it. And they were just laying on my desk. And I looked at that red book, and I believe that God laid on my heart a way that you and I could partner together. And here's the way it works. I believe that if you will stand with us, some of you can do $50 a month, some do a lot more, but if you can do at least $50 a month, that'll make you a Red Book partner. What I do, you give me your name, not only your name, if you want your wife, you and your wife's name, if you're in business, the name of your business, the name of your partner, whatever that is, you give me the names. I will write them down in my red book that stays on my desk 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never leaves. And I'll write your name down. And what I, here's how we'll, we'll do this. I'll help you because I promise that every day when I open that book, I will call your name out out loud. My, my employees know they can come by and they join in sometime and help me pray. And no secret about it, but I'll call your name out. If, you have, if you've given me the name of your business, I'll call your business out. I just believe the Bible says, call unto me and I'll answer you. So that's my deal with you. I'll remember to pray for you and I'll trust God with all my heart that God will meet your need. I can't promise you things that God doesn't make available. Whatever God makes available to you, I will trust him to feed it to you, whether it's finance, whether it's health, whatever it is. So if you do that, you will help me. See, I help you because I'll pray for you with all my heart. But you will help me reach people around the entire globe. What an honor it is. And remember, we're in the last moments of time. I need you to help me get the gospel out because I give an altar call every single program where they get a chance to receive Christ. And a lot of times we have our whole congregation pray a sinner's prayer so that they can serve as a catalyst as they join people in far-flung nations of the world. Will you stand with Brother Dave and become a Red Book partner? I'll look forward to hearing from you as soon as you can, you can write. I appreciate it so very much. You mean a lot to me. Without you, I couldn't do this. So stand with Brother Dave, and I'll stand with you. It's time for me to leave, but I can tell you something. You really do not have any trouble. All you need is faith in God, because faith in God moves mighty mouths. And I have a great feeling in my heart. Being together today, the Lord has blessed us real good. Amen. <laughs>